have to say, I'm just so happy to be here. Uh, very thrilled to have been invited. I, I really appreciate that. To share with you something that uh, I think may be new to you. Uh, thinking about how can we use geographic information at the point of personal care. Uh, when a patient sees their clinician. Um, but to get there, we're going to go through an entire story. And uh, maybe at the end, you'll also kind of see how my two worlds are connected. Um, and I think GIS brings it all together. So the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to talk about how we got to this place in time where geomedicine could be a reality. And uh, so it won't be a full history I give you, but a selective history uh, based on what I think is interesting. And then I'm going to define geomedicine and tell you about it from a number of different perspectives. Uh, how different uh, patients versus clinicians, health systems might be thinking about this. Um, and sort of integrated with this, I'll be talking about challenges as they come up. Certainly technology challenges, uh, as well as culture change. You know, that's always a difficult one. It's way harder than technology. And then training, you know, how do we get a workforce ready to do this? So that's the plan. Now, it didn't surprise me that the first time I had heard about health and place was with Hippocrates. And uh, so you can see that this was around 460 BC. And uh, he had some writings on airs, waters, and places. And uh, so I wanted to share with you what he said. So he said, when a race lives in a rough, mountainous country at high elevation and well watered, where great differences of climate accompany the various seasons, there the people will be of large physique well accustomed to hardihood and bravery, with no small degree of fierceness and wildness in their character. Okay? Now, on the other hand, he said, in low-lying, stifling lands, full of meadows, getting a larger share of warm than cold winds, and where the water is warm, the people will be neither nar large nor slight, but rather broad in build and fleshy. Bravery and hardihood are not a natural or integral part of their characters. And so as we begin this, I want to point out to you where I live and ask you to please be gentle with me because I do belong with the cowardly and the meek. But I bet that you hadn't heard the story about the great physician at Grazis, who was a fabulous spatial thinker. Now, he was truly a Renaissance man. He wrote encyclopedias on all sorts of topics, not just medicine, but he thought about uh, many different things. What made him unique in medicine is that he approached disease based on observation rather than on spiritualism. Now, he was alive during the Middle Ages, so this is quite, quite unique. Um, but he was a great spatial thinker, and that's what I want to tell you about. He got tasked with finding the location to build the next hospital in Baghdad. And so what he did is he walked around the city, and he hung slabs of beef in the corners of the city. And he continued to monitor those slabs of beef to find out which one putrefied the slowest. Because in that location, he figured the air must be cleaner and everything must be healthier in that location, so that's the best place to build a hospital. So that's great spatial thinking. And then this has been noted as the first uh, map that is health-related from 1694. Now, this comes from a man named Filippo Arrieta, who was uh, an assistant to the royal governor in this area or province of Bari, which is uh, near Naples in Italy. And this map is uh, focusing on plague. And what you can see in the map, and I'll help you to see it more clearly, is that although they didn't know what caused plague at the time, they did know that it could sometimes be contained. So this map is all about containment and quarantine. So the first level of containment is along the shoreline. And you can see that they've got these boats protecting the shore, not letting anybody come into the affected area. Then they've got a second level of quarantine around that area. And the little dots that you're seeing are actually meant to uh, symbolize military tents. So there was a very strong military presence here. And then they knew that uh, they needed to restrict travel a little more broadly, so they have a third area of quarantine around the entire province. And so you also see the little tents there um, spaced out a little bit more. 
Within the province, the other things that you can uh, make out is any of the buildings uh, represent either hospitals or churches if they have a cross on them. And then the, uh, the trees are, are unpopulated areas. But this is officially the first mental health map. And then if you go forward about 150 years, you get to France. And in France, they started to have uh, the ability or the thinking to do choropleth mapping. And so André Michel Gary started to create comparative choropleth maps. So he looked at this idea of moral statistics, looking at crimes against persons, crimes against property, and education levels. And he also did to do this health map looking at suicides in France. And uh, then there is, uh, not too many years later, Du Chatelet's prostitution map. This is in, in Paris. And uh, I, actually, where you see dark colors is near where the Moulin Rouge is. Uh, so it's not surprising uh, this, this uh, habit continued. But what I think is interesting, and I just show you this for fun, is uh, there's the Moulin Rouge. Uh, a different kind of mapping was done by Doug McCune in San Francisco area, and he used elevation to indicate uh, prostitution in the San Francisco area. And so this is down Market Street, and uh, this second peak, I'll show you a little bit better, is in the Tenderloin District, so he's naming this Mount Loin, um, <laughs> appropriately so. And he notes, you know, with his technique, how prostitution is casting a shadow over the majority of the city. So, a clever way of uh, sending a message. But that was just for fun. Now, this next story, uh, I'm guessing you may have heard of, if you uh, know something about uh, health and mapping. But I'm going to start it in maybe a little bit different way. In London, they had just finished uh, their second epidemic of cholera. And after that, 54 of London's poorest citizens sent a note to the London Times. And in that note, they wrote, we live in muck and filth. We ain't got no privies, no dustbins, no drains, not water supplies, and no drain or sewer in the whole place. We all of us suffer, and numbers are ill. And if the cholera comes, Lord help us. Unfortunately, it was just a few years later that the cholera did come, and people were terrified because one person could wake up in good health, and within 12 hours they'd be dead. They would suffer from abdominal cramps and a racking thirst and this terrible watery diarrhea. And in this one location, within 250 yards of the intersection of Cambridge and Broad Streets, more than 500 people died in a little more than a week. So think about that in a neighborhood. That's a lot of friends and neighbors. And so in comes Dr. John Snow, since named the father of modern epidemiology. He's going to be our hero for this story. And he created the most famous of all health maps, which is uh, this map. And what you're seeing is the Soho District in London in the early 1850s. And all of the dark bars that you're seeing are deaths from cholera in a household. But what you can't see, and I'll help you, uh, is that he also mapped water pumps in the area. He had a, a number of theories and went through them, but one of his theories was that maybe cholera happened in the water. Because uh, again, nobody knew what caused it. And you can see that there's an awful lot of death from cholera out around this one water pump. And so he talked to the, um, they didn't have a public health department, but he talked to officials at the time. They took the handle off of the water pump and it ended the cholera epidemic that year. So he is uh, certainly a, a hero of spatial thinking. And uh, if you ever get to London, you can celebrate Dr. Snow at the John Snow Pub, which is uh, very near that intersection uh, at Lexington and Broadwick Streets. So don't forget to stop by. So this next story is uh, about one of the greatest public health achievements of the last hundred years. So I would have to ask you, what would you rather have? Modeled teeth or dental caries? So you may guess, this is the story of community fluoridated drinking water. And fluoride, of course, is an odorless and colorless mineral. It occurs naturally um, in the earth, but at different levels. And the good news is it makes your teeth very strong. The bad news is, in excess, it can cause a brown stain known as modeling. So I'm going to tell you this story about uh, Dr. Frederick McKay, who was a young dentist at the time uh, in 1910. And he saw that a lot of his kids in Colorado uh, were suffering from this brown stain on their teeth. Uh, but he also noticed 
that uh, they seem to have some resistance to tooth decay. So he brought in this uh, dental researcher, Dr. G.B. Black, and together they sort of worked on this issue and, and actually together made that correlation. But unfortunately, Dr. Black died in 1915, so Dr. McKay had to move on with this research on his own. But in 1923, he had a stroke of good luck. He had been invited to a community in Oakley, Idaho, where the kids were just having really severe brown stains on their teeth. And uh, so he was asked to come out and examine the area, and he noted that that community had a brand new pipeline that was supplying their water. Again, you know, he didn't know um, that it was fluoride that was, or, uh, that was causing this, but he saw the new pipeline and he told the parents, why don't you get your water from the nearby well instead? And so when the kids got their permanent teeth, they were fine. And so then they could start to make the relationship of, of fluoride in the water. So he had to start thinking about, well, how much fluoride? Because some seems to be good when preventing cavities, uh, but too much is, is not so good. So uh, laboratory testing started to happen, and this is when he brought in Dr. H. Trenley Dean of the U.S. Public Health Service. And they worked together on this dose question. And uh, they finally came up with an answer in 1950. They were able to say that one part per million of fluoride was the best dose to prevent cavities and not get the brown stain. And that's actually what's recommended today still. So in just five years of that recommendation, in communities that had fluoridated drinking water, the prevalence of tooth decay decreased by 45 to 94 percent. And this is why it's one of the greatest public health uh, interventions of the last hundred years. But people ask, well, you know, you're putting fluoride in the water. Is this safe? Is it ethical? It's like putting a medicine in my drinking water. Um, so a lot of people are upset about this, and there actually was one research study that uh, indicated it could cause a bone cancer. That research has been debunked even by the author um, who found errors in their work. But the opposition remains significant in some areas. And I'll have to say, you know, in California, right around uh, where I live in the north, um, San Jose is the largest unfluoridated city uh, in, in actually the country. So then I found this map. And uh, this comes from uh, Covert Action Quarterly. Uh, <laughs> It's not something I subscribe to, but uh, I love the title, Fluoride, Coming Plot or Capitalist Ploy. And what they're showing here is the percent of the public that is receiving community fluoridated water in 1992. And you can see California's number 48. Um, so I know we think that uh, we're always the pioneers in leading the charge, but in this case, we were well behind. Um, but in talking about this whole uh, idea of fluoride and dental health and geomedicine and how can we use geography at the point of care. I was talking to um, Eric, uh, Dr. Fernandez e. E. Garcia, who's one of my colleagues, and he's a pediatrician at UC Davis. And he said, oh, geomedicine, I do that all the time. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> uh, I had no idea. And he knows nothing about GIS, but he showed me this. This map that he uses, uh, that came from First Five, California, it's a paper map, and he said, this map has fluoride levels on it. So areas that are blue or tan are fluoridated, and areas that are white or orange are not. And so when, when a patient comes in, he maps their address, and if they need a prescription for fluoride, he writes it. So he does geomedicine every day in clinic, uh, just very low-tech geomedicine. So let's get on to what is the definition of geomedicine. Now, Dorland's Medical Dictionary does define it, and they say that it's the branch of medicine dealing with the influence of climatic and environmental conditions on health. So that's okay. Um, I think that this has broad implications for population and public health, uh, but I didn't think that their definition went far enough, so I thought maybe someday somebody will credit me with writing my own. Um, so my interpretation of this definition is that geomedicine is really the branch of medicine in which the body of knowledge about how the environmental conditions um, environmental being interpreted broadly, influence, influencing health can be leveraged then to improve personal health. How can we make ourselves healthier by understanding um, our geographic exposures? So I thought that this was a much more translational way to consider the definition. Um, it's meant to link GIS research with clinical care to get better outcomes. And it goes to what we already know, that our health is composed of our genetic makeup, our behaviors, and then that elusive big thing called the environment. So 
in clinical health, um, one of the early adopters of, of this idea of thinking about geography in clinical health was uh, Jack Wenberg. And he was the one who initiated the Dartmouth Atlas Project as the uh, principal inve investigator. And he said it's not just air, water, or infections. Actually, the density of medical practitioners of different types makes a difference in an individual's access to health care and social services. The likelihood of even getting a correct diagnosis or having a chance for a successful outcome based on treatment options available at different places. Or it's even uh, rel related to your ability to receive affordable and timely care. And I had the chance to uh, meet Dr. Weinberg at the Esri UC last year uh, when he was promoting his brand new book, Tracking Medicine. So if you're interested in the topic, uh, that would be an excellent uh, reading choice. But let's talk about geomedicine now from a couple of different perspectives so you get a sense of what it might really mean to uh, the different stakeholders uh, in this area. So from the patient perspective, I mean, you know, if you're a patient, what do you want to know? Um, how can you take advantage of geographic knowledge? Well, I think a lot of what you as a patient would want to know is what are the resources around me that can help improve my health? Now, there was this app that uh, won an award that started to do that uh, in a small way. Um, it wasn't based on just healthcare, but they were saying, okay, if we know your position, these are the important things around you, banks, gas stations, uh, hospital, pharmacy. Now it seems old hat, we all have, have this available. But they did win a um, uh, prize for their application. So, so that's a little bit of the patient perspective. This next example is a patient and clinician perspective, how, how they might work together. And this, uh, this is one of my favorite examples. I really like it. And I borrowed uh, the slides from my colleague at UC San Diego, Dr. James Killeen, who's an emergency room physician and uh, has been working on this through a grant-funded study. And so uh, in this, he's got a non-electronic medical record solution, so it's a standalone product. That's a downside, but uh, a lot of those are being created. And it's a patient portal, so he can communicate with the patient through this, uh, this application. And so you go into the application, a patient's got a profile. This is Gloria Gilliam, who's a 24-year-old woman, and she's got eczema and asthma, and uh, takes two medications for her asthma. And so uh, then Gloria is equipped with a cell phone and this little doodad here. So if you haven't seen this before, this is something made by Propeller Health, and it is a GPS sensor. It fits right on the asthma inhaler. And so every time you use your inhaler and you hit that sensor, it records a date, time, and location stamp that can then be sent directly to your cell phone and mapping product. So now you can see maybe where your triggers are. Where are you using your inhaler most? But he took it a step further. So this is uh, what it would look like in terms of the map, you know, over six months usage. Uh, this one is a week at a glance. We see that the asthma inhaler use is potentially appropriate, although you can see the areas um, right here where you might have a, a slightly hot spot. But based on the calculations, this is still a good control of asthma. So then he takes it to another level using this product uh, from CitySense. And this is a personal pollution monitor. It's a little bit boxy at the moment. They haven't made it attractive yet. But it does um, record three different pollutants. It has ozone, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen dioxide. And again, this has got a little uh, port that hooks into your cell phone. And you can get air quality readings directly from this device that you can wear on your backpack or your belt or whatever. Um, it's bulky, but it's lightweight. So then you get something like this breadcrumb crumb trail showing um, the levels of pollutants for all of the places that you went. Um, in this case, this uh, pop-up shows that uh, there was a little bit more carbon monoxide than nitrogen dioxide or ozone. So you can imagine now, having all of this data, you might start to make some connections. So the application will record all of this for you in something that looks a little bit like this. And so if I blow it up, what you get is your um, air quality sensor measurements. Uh, the three different colored lines are uh, red is the carbon monoxide, and purple is the ozone, and nitrogen dioxide is in green. And then you also get your metered dose triggers from your inhaler. And so you can start to make connections. Uh, you know, that first trigger could have been from carbon monoxide. 
And uh, then when you look at the next two, there's uh, slight little bumps in the ozone, and maybe those were uh, the trigger for, for those uh, inhaler doses. So then the patient can say, okay, I'm putting all this information together and just sending it as a package to my provider. And so she sends it, she gets a return message saying, yep, got your message. And then uh, the provider can open it and look at uh, the results and say, okay, this is not well-controlled asthma. So now he sends a message back to the patient saying, you should increase the frequency of your inhaler to two puffs uh, four times a day, and uh, I'll see you in clinic next week. So then, think about taking this to another level. So I think this is a good example of true um, geomedicine from a patient and clinician perspective. Both are participating and interpreting the information and making decisions on that. Uh, but then what if you take, for instance, the CitySense uh, pollution monitor and contribute everybody's data, everyone who's using it? Uh, you could get some really nice maps that way. And this is exactly what is happening in Louisville, Kentucky which does have a beautiful skyline, but they actually have one of the worst pollution problems in the country. Um, and because of that, they have very high rates of emergency room and hospital use for asthma and exacerbations. So in 2012, um, they applied for and received an IBM Smarter Cities Initiative grant. And with that grant, they wanted to identify their community-wide asthma triggers that could be improved or eliminated. Uh, of course, they didn't want to focus on the things that, that they can't fix. Uh, but they're using that propeller health sensor, they're using city sets, and doing all sorts of other um, GIS analyses, looking at uh, you know, school um, absences and, and work absences, uh, to try and figure out what is going on in their city. And they're, uh, they have two papers related to this. They're both in press, so they're embargoed. Uh, and so I can't tell you the results because I don't have them. I've only been told that they're impressive. So we all have to be on the lookout for that to see if it's real. So, so the question that we have to ask ourselves is how can we take advantage of this great kind of population data that we've been working on in public health to inform our personal health? So thinking about the clinician's perspective uh, individually. You know, a clinician's pretty good at asking the who, what, when, and why questions. But we're not so good at asking where questions of our patients, unless they're saying, you know, I, I just got back from an exotic trip, or, um, or unless they're planning to go on a trip and, and then we send them to travel clinic. So the reason is that it's uh, complex and hard to ask these questions in a very short clinical visit. Um, and you don't want to just ask, you know, where do you live, but you want to know where have you lived in the past, where do you work, where do you travel, how do you spend your time? And if you do it right, it can get pretty complicated. And this is the result of somebody uh, uh, at Esri who tracked their time for an entire year. And uh, so doing it right is hard. So what do we need? How can we, how can we capture this kind of information? Uh, we certainly have important informatics needs. Electronic medical records first have to be able to store the information. Uh, right now, you know, you put in one address for billing purposes, it's not standardized or geocoded. Uh, so how can we not only improve that process, but then have this uh, repository with previous addresses and amount of time spent at work uh, or at home? So one way to potentially do this is to empower patients in waiting rooms instead of sitting around uh, reading the latest magazines that nobody's interested in. They could potentially work on a kiosk and start loading their previous addresses, even if it's just uh, remembering a city or a county they lived in. So that might be one solution, but of course there's an app for that, um, or in this case there was an app for that. Uh, it's uh, not available anymore, but the point of this slide is the technology is there. Um, and I will tell you that it's actually possible to get it into an EMR, and I draw on this technology as evidence, uh, because I think it's somewhat similar. So glucose levels for diabetics, you know, I mean they're taking their blood sugar up to four times a day, and uh, so it's got that temporal component and needs to be recorded in electronic medical record. So in this case, it's a wireless glucose monitor. Um, this particular example is 3G, sent over a cell phone to a data warehouse that the clinician can then access and make decisions on. So again, my point is the technology is there. We just have to make it work for a different purpose. 
So then you get all of this information. What do you do with it? Well, another informatics need is decision support tools. Right, so that you can put together a patient's place history, where they've been, uh, lived and worked, with their known medical history, which is going to tell you something about their susceptibility to disease. And then you've got all of these place key exposures. So I know that uh, you know in Scranton, Pennsylvania, there's exposure to methane gas. And what does that exposure then mean in terms of risk of particular diseases? And then you put it all together so that the clinician now, without having to do anything else, can say, oh, for this individual, I may have to screen five years earlier for uh, uh, colon cancer or you know, do something different when they have symptoms because I, I have a little bit of an early warning sign here. So for uh, my friend at Esri, when you take his place history and break it down, uh, this is what it looks like. And ultimately, the way he calculated it, he spent 67% of his years in compromised environments, and 70% of his hours were spent within his community in those environments. So according to his research, his geographically relevant or place history leads to an increased risk for cardiovascular, pulmonary, and central nervous system health issues. And uh, in fact, he did suffer a heart attack, which is part of what made him think about this. Uh, he's fine. Uh, but, but it got him interested in the topic. You know, why did my physician never ask me what my exposures were if my exposures all lead to an increased risk for cardiovascular disease? How could I have done things differently if I had had that information or if my clinician had that information? So now let me move on to a sort of a broader perspective. How would my health system think about geomedicine? And uh, certainly healthcare reform has had uh, a big uh, driving, has been a big driving force in making us consider upstream effects of medicine. And uh, so I point to this book. This is uh, one of my friends, Rishi Manchanda, who wrote this book called The Upstream Doctors. It is available on Amazon for 99 cents. I have no financial interest whatsoever. <laughs> it's just a good read. Uh, but he, in the beginning of his book, he tells a story that I really like. And the story goes something like this. Three friends come upon this beautiful river, and they're standing at the side of the river, uh, just watching it. And all of a sudden, um, a young child <laughs> is uh, screaming and paddling and trying to keep its head above water coming down the river. Um, and this is a problem because uh, at the end of the river, there is this great, huge waterfall. And so the friends jump in and, and pull the child out. Well, as soon as they get the child out, they see another child coming down. And this continues time after time, and the kids start to come faster, and the current starts to move faster, and they're getting exhausted. They're starting to do this all day long, and uh, don't know what to do or how to stop the problem. And so after some time, um, they can't give up because uh, they're being pretty successful saving most of the kids, um, but they just don't know what to do. And then one of them just takes off and starts swimming upstream. Uh, and so this is that uh, swimmer. And the others are astounded, and they stop, and they yell at this person and say, what are you doing? Why are you swimming away? And uh, this one person says, I'm swimming upstream to find out who's throwing the kids in the water. Um, so getting to the root cause of the problem, right? You need to go upstream to figure out what are, what are those factors that are causing the problem. Um, and this is often referred to as the social determinants of health, and I just use this diagram to point out that the upstream factors include these important things like class, race, ethnicity, gender, immigration status, sexual orientation, among other things. Um, so we need to think about those things. And Rishi Machada has been doing that in his clinic in a way that I think is an effective use of geomedicine. So he tells people, and I agree, that if you want to make a difference in improving health on an individual level, it is not in medical care. That, I mean, yes, obviously that's important, but that's only 10% of the impact on health. Family history and behaviors, of course, are the majority, but if you really want to make an impact, you can go to social and environmental factors and you can do quite a lot there. So this is where he's focusing a lot of his attention. And what he's done is he's got a, a clinic, a small community clinic in Los Angeles, and he's used GIS, GIS to map 54,000 patient records on what he's saying is housing-related illnesses um, that are associated with asthma in his population. 
And he hadn't realized this before he started actually questioning one patient that he couldn't get better. No matter how much medicine he gave her, she continued to be sick. And uh, when he did this, he saw clusters of asthma that he had never seen before. And so he cross-referenced this information with uh, local housing enforcement code records, uh, which he does note are sometimes hard to get. Um, but you can find out where, not only you know, from the census, where houses may be older, but where there are code violations, because uh, that tends to be where people are getting sick. So he did that, and then uh, he took that, in order to start to get that information on a more regular basis, he developed a new intake form for patients that they could fill out in the waiting room. And it asked questions about housing and schools, uh, where people were going, what kinds of neighborhoods they lived in. And he started to link patients with community uh, services that, that were available. And uh, so then how did he get those community resources? He crowdsourced them. He asked people what are their favorite parks, walking trails, and exercise programs. Where are the great farmers markets in the area? Um, where are there lawyers who are open to doing pro bono work that can help address these uh, housing code issues? And where are there dynamic teachers who are interested in health issues who can start to tell people that there is a correlation between where you live and your health? And then they can start to uh, work on these interventions. So he's been doing all of this, and I just think that it's a really brilliant use of, of geomedicine. So I highly recommend his 99 cent book. Um, then there is the public health perspective. And so I would say that epidemiologists absolutely need to continue to do their great work um, continuing this research on the environmental factors that correlate with risk of health problems. And we need to know things like how long do you have to be exposed to something and how much exposure do you need before you get sick, right? Otherwise, we can't do those decision support tools down the road. What are the interactions of multiple exposures? I mean, it's hard enough to figure out if you're exposed to methane gas, but maybe you're also exposed to some other pollutant, um, and maybe they interact in some way that you know, catalyzes your risk of disease. And how do exposures relate to individual biological susceptibility? You know, I mean, an exposure for a young, healthy person might be quite different, of course, than an exposure for a very young person who maybe has an underdeveloped immune system, or an older person who maybe has some illness and, uh, and an immune system that is not working as well. We need to consider large geographies, like the entire US, at local scales so that, uh, that we can get things done. Because we all know, preaching to the crowd, that uh, variation happens locally. And they need to consider making data and maps available online um, so that they can be consumed. You know, and there's, I'm sure you guys have heard, there's all sorts of developer uh, challenges and codeathons, hackathons, data palooza's, um, where people are getting money to create these apps to mash up different uh, health data sets and come up with solutions. Um, and of course, I, I can't mention any of this without saying that this is health data we're talking about. We always have to be cognizant of the privacy issues and do it right. Uh, it can't be done, it just needs to be done right. And so I wanted that to lead into a brief discussion of some of the things that are going on in health informatics, uh, public health, um, and data in general. And one of them is open data. So that suggestion that epidemiologists need to make their data available and consumable is happening. And uh, good news, and I, I'm leading the charge in California, and we're going to have an open data portal uh, for our data sets starting in August. So I'm working really hard on getting data sets ready and uh, expect about five or six data sets to start, and then we'll add to it and add other agencies uh, after public health. So healthcare services with cost data, um, the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development with emergency room um, and hospital discharge data, uh, social services with foster care and other uh, child relevant data. Uh, so it's all going to be up there. And in fact, the rest of California government is uh, interested in doing this too. So data sets like transportation and parks, etc. So open data, if you're not familiar with it, is really just about making data usable. It's data that can be freely used, reused, and redistributed by anyone subject only at most to the requirement to attribute and share alike. So this is all about government transparency. Um, I see it mostly used in that venue. Um, so, so one place that I just wanted to let you know about if you haven't heard of it is um, the Health Data Palooza, which I think is a great place for innovation.
innovation and uh, hopefully innovation about geomedicine. So this is a conference that takes place at the federal level every year. It's in Washington, D.C. I'm actually going next weekend, um, so it's always in, in early June. And the point is that data mining, which, you know, if you're a researcher at all, you know has always been kind of a dirty word. I will tell you now that data mining can be done in intelligent ways, and it doesn't have to be a dirty word anymore. Um, and to give you a sense of what's happened in the last year, in 2012, uh, or 2013 actually, data.gov, the open data portal uh, for the, the federal government, had 75,000 data sets available. Um, over 60,000 of those were geospatial, by the way, so if you're looking for data, you have a choice. Um, and in one year, there were, uh, just like a month ago, 90,000 plus data sets. When we go to healthdata.gov, a year ago there were 411, now there are 1,540. When we get California on board, it's going to skyrocket. Um, so that's my personal promise to you. And Narav Shah, for all of his work in New York, won the first ever Health Data Liberator Award. So I just want you to get a sense of what the trend is, that there is a trend towards sharing and openness and uh, putting data in the hands of people who can innovate and do something great with it. So uh, again, from the public health perspective, there are a number of other things going on. Uh, public health agencies are collecting clinical information now in different ways. So maybe in the future there's going to be less reliance on uh, sampling through surveys and we'll be able to get actual clinical data to make decisions. Um, so potentially this will be more accurate as well. And uh, we should also be able to, to then turn around and share those data with clinicians. So what do I mean by that? Well, in my last few slides, I want to tell you about uh, what's going on in the world, if you haven't heard. Um, in 2009, we had the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And that act was meant to invest billions of dollars into the American economy in particular uh, sectors of the economy, of course, as stimulus. One sector was health IT. And so from that was developed high tech which is uh, an acronym for Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health. Well, the whole purpose of high tech was to incentivize hospitals and providers to start using electronic health records, because the idea was that this is how we're going to get more value. We're going to, one, I have to say, be able to read people's uh, uh, thoughts, um, having them through non-electronic records, and data can be shared. Right, from one provider to another much more easily. It might avoid uh, duplication in lab tests when you move from one provider to another or radiographic tests. Uh, so, so the thought was that when you have electronic health records, you're going to improve uh, patient outcomes. Well, incentivizing people to use and adopt electronic health records is one thing, but how do you figure out that they actually did it and did it right? Well, something similar happened in Australia many years ago where they were going to provide $10,000 to clinicians who adopted an electronic health record. So a bunch of clinicians went out, paid $1,500 for a laptop, put a patient record on there, and claimed their $10,000. So they got an $8,500 profit and uh, you know, a new laptop. Um, so the U.S. didn't want that to happen. So they created meaningful use. And meaningful use began, uh, and has since grown, with a 555-page document saying exactly what you have to be able to do with your health record to get the incentive. But the incentive is uh, uh, somewhere around $65,000 per provider, so it's worthwhile. But the reason that this is relevant uh, to public health especially is that in stage two of meaningful use, clinicians and hospitals have to share data with public health. And the data that they have to share are these uh, ones that are listed. They share electronic data for immunizations. So now we can have a statewide immunization registry, uh, which we've never had. Um, we have uh, now a registry for reportable lab results. So all of those communicable infectious diseases now get reported to, to the state. We can do syndromic surveillance. Um, this one is an optional measure, and I have to say, you know, please ask me if you want to know more, but syndromic surveillance is a little tricky, um, not easy to do, and I'm sure, I don't think it's well proven. It also uh, has the option of doing, reporting cancer cases for a cancer registry, and, you know, I have to tell you, California already has the best cancer registry in the country, um, but this will make it electronic, and data will come faster and populate that registry sooner. And then they have this section called Other Registries, which is ill-defined, and uh, so we can make that up. And 
And so if you have ideas for other registries that we should have in public health, let me know. But what's exciting about meaningful use and why it's relevant to geomedicine, I think, is that stage three is about bi-directional exchange. So let's take the immunization registry example. Now I have a statewide immunization registry, but it doesn't do anybody any good if you can't tap into that, right, and find out, okay, the child before me lived in Southern California, moved to Northern California, has already had four doctors. How do I know what their, their immunizations have been? Um, I personally have been fully immunized three different times because my records got lost. So I'm well protected, you know, exposed to anything. But uh, there was a lot of pain and suffering that went along with that. So, uh, so this is a great way to collect uh, a lot of data and uh, start to use it in meaningful ways and, and give that environmental exposure information back to, uh, to clinicians to use for personal health. So you can imagine that with all this data exchange and collecting data, we are going to be struck with this tidal wave of big data. And so just briefly, um, you're probably aware of the three Bs of big data. Um, some people say like seven or ten Bs. You can come up with as many Bs as you like. But the primary Bs are the volume of data. And if you weren't aware, um, we collect now in two days the same amount of data that has been collected from the beginning of time to 2003. Every two days we collect that much. So the volume of data is immense. And uh, we're quickly headed toward zettabytes of data. This is a storage issue as well as a retrieval issue. Uh, and then there is the velocity of data. So it's not only coming in very quickly, but we need to be able to analyze and return answers to data very quickly. Imagine the situation of credit card transactions and potential fraud, right? You, you can't be fast enough to prevent fraud. It's got to be immediate. Uh, and then there's the variety of data. We have so much now. It's not just you know, a, a spreadsheet or a database. It's video files, uh, click streams, log files, uh, all sorts of audio files. Uh, all of this can be analyzed. So in the health arena, we think about things like genetic data, uh, certainly big data, imaging data, um, electronic medical record data. What do we do with all of this? And then you've got the quantified self. Right, in many ways, uh, people are measuring their heart rates, their blood sugars, their blood pressure, and then you've got your outdoor environmental sensors. How do we capture all of that and put it together to make use so that we can improve personal health? And then, of course, uh, maybe your doctor can even figure out from your, uh, your retail data that you had those Pillsbury crescent rolls and two packages of bacon. Uh, so, so there's a lot of data out there that can be consumed and used for our health. But Processing big data is not a little issue. Uh, it requires hundreds to thousands of servers, and they need to work in parallel. So the computational infrastructure for this is going to be difficult for any one institution to maintain. So the solution really probably needs to be in the cloud to take advantage of dynamically allocating uh, the computing resources over the internet. And so this is where uh, Hadoop comes in. Um, if you're not familiar with Hadoop, this is what uh, Google uses and, and a number of uh, big names that you would be familiar with. But it, it's, it is a framework for processing big data and repackaging it in, in ways where it can be processed. But the reason that I bring this up here is because Hadoop tools are incorporated in the Esri software. Um, so if you are doing big geographic analysis, you can actually get answers back on data sets that have billions of records within two or three minutes. So pretty remarkable processing, considering what we've been used to. And the reason that this is important is because uh, we've got to make the data smaller. So this graphic is showing you facts per decision um, on this side. And this uh, side over here is saying, OK, what facts are we talking about? In proteomics and genomics, you, know, you just have so many facts to deal with. And how do you put them all together? Um, but here's the interesting part is over time, over all of these years, our human cognitive capacity to make decisions based on facts has not changed at all. So with this big data revolution, we've got to have analytics that will make it reasonable for our uh, capable but small minds um, to, to make wise decisions. And so just to finish up here, um, how are we going to do all of this? I mean, it, it's a lot to take in and a lot to think about. Well, healthcare providers need to have some training. They need to learn how to think spatially. Um, 
There are certainly some that do. I do. Uh, but not everybody does, and so I think that uh, training needs to start earlier, uh, like in medical school, to get some of this context, context, you know. I talked to you about the history, uh, just understanding some of that history I think helps people to understand what spatial thinking can do. Um, and I do think that some specific spatial uh, skills development needs to occur, you know, maybe some basic interaction with the software uh, would help. But then we also need analysts, and I think that's become clear in many ways. Data scientists and computer scientists need to work together with epidemiologists, geographers, statisticians, and more. I mean, today I think uh, you've probably all noticed we can't do anything anymore without team science. We all have to work together because we have such small areas of specialization um, that it's really important that we, we pool our resources to get the job done. And so I ask, you know, it's been said that genomics is the area of personalized medicine. Uh, based on the awareness that genetic variations can cause different patients to respond in different ways to the same medication. Okay, that's genome-based medicine. But I would argue that your unique exposure history has just as much to offer in your healthcare and should be as well-funded, if there's anybody who knows anyone from the NIH, um, and that is what geomedicine is about. So I think it's nature and nurture. And uh, so let me summarize what I've told you uh, in a nutshell. There's a long history of spatial correlations with health. Geomedicine proposes to bring geographic knowledge to the point of care. And policy and technology are, in fact, evolving to create what I would call a generational moment in healthcare. Things are changing in ways we maybe couldn't have imagined, but it's a pretty exciting time. And just to show you that I'm truly a GIS geek, I'm leaving you with this picture and would be happy to take any questions at this point.